Now, I know from your feedback that your favorite part of these calls is a further flesh out of our new holdings, what we bought since I spoke to you last. Now, last week, did a little controversial position. We initiated a stock, a financial technology company that should benefit from the powerful worldwide trend towards a cashless society, as MasterCard has, as the company Visa made so much money as. And the one I'm talking about is First Data Corporation. That's FDC, which trades right now at $18.06. If you're unfamiliar with the company, you may have already used First Data's most recognizable technology without even realizing it. It's their point of sale system called Clover. It can be found at many small and large businesses across the country with a growing international presence. First Data has been going through quite the transformation process over the last few years, having gone private via KKR and then come public again not that long ago. There have been a lot of turnover at the top. But now at last, there is steady and excellent management whom I spent some time with. Starts at the top with CEO Frank Bizignano, and Frank is one of the most successful bankers I have ever met. First Data has a history of carrying an excessive amount of debt on their balance sheet, too much to, too much to our previous liking, as part of that buyout that I described. But it is hard to find a better fit to navigate through a debt-heavy balance sheet uh, situation than this man, Frank. He's got a fabulous record in banking. He could have gone anywhere. He didn't need to work here. His commitment to prudently delevering the company by paying down a strategic amount of debt has opened up free cash flows and improved the company's position. The company's been a huge beneficiary of lower rates. The cash free up has allowed First Data to shift from a company focused only on paying down near-term debt, and there's virtually none now, to a company that is ready to go out and play some offense, do some buying of ac- making some acquisitions. How has this been shown? First Data's acquisition of Card Connect back in May was an exciting move that the street didn't even recognize. Uh, and this product's integration with Clover will create a powerful combination, as described by Frank Bizignano on their last earnings call. Card Connect is an advanced payment solution a provider that securely processes and manages transactions for companies of all different sizes. Its card point service specializes in providing reporting and transaction management for small to mid-sized businesses. And its card secure services protects and encrypts transaction data safely and securely for enterprise level organizations. I wonder if the people at uh, Equifax ever thought about this kind of thing. This deal marked the transition from a more more forward-looking company hungry to increase market share from a company that's really playing defense. First Data wants Clover to dominate the marketplace by being the biggest and best business management system that is the solution for all its clients' needs, and the two products combined will provide additional tools and services to First Data's distribution partners. Go to the website. All this is explained. I don't want to get too much nitty-gritty, but let's just say this company looks like a lot of other companies that have been soaring. Although Monday's announcement that the private equity firm KKR was issuing a secondary offering, price today, this morning, 1775, 85,000, I'm sorry, 85 million shares. That's very important. I'm going to talk about that more in a second. Please remember that this deal has no implications on first data's business or strategic intent. This move is simply part of KKR's strategy to gradually scale out a position in the exact same fashion as any smart investor would do. They have to raise money. They have to show their partners uh, and their investors that they're you know, ringing the register to do more deals. It's no different from what we would do for the trust when we're looking to pocket some gains. KKR executed this exact same strategy once before when they gradually unloaded their position in Dollar General starting in April 2010 when the stock was at 27, and they continually sold shares every six months to one year at increasingly higher prices, selling in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, finally closing out at about the $60 per share in 2013. And this stock has only climbed higher since. Look, if KKR felt any bit of pessimism in this stock, they wouldn't scale out. They would blow out. That's simply not the case. That's why we issued a bulletin this very morning saying, don't wait for the conference call. Start buying FDC because it was down below 18. Now, it's the fact that uh, we call supply begetting demand here. That's something my friend Lee Cooperman, who introduced me to FTC, talks about. And I think that that's what happened with FTC. It's why the stock market is looking at the price. It's above the offering price because it's brought out buyers who wanted to get in. That being said, we think the balance sheet improvement and the growing acquisition story should help the stock trade at higher multiples, ones that are closer to its fintech peers. Remember we made all that money in PayPal? Or how about Square? We didn't, that was one I wish we invested in. I liked it for mad money, but it seems it doesn't make money. So I was a little more hesitant. MasterCard and Visa have been terrific. 
These companies have all been very successful in their payment provider and solutions businesses. And since First Data's products complement those companies so well, they, they work with everybody. I see no reason why this stock, FDC, cannot rise closer to their ranks in valuation. Hey, let's take a look at some of the comps. You know what I'm talking about. First Data's revenues are about 10 times that of Square, which just hit its 52-week high. Yet First Data only trades at a 1.6 higher valuation. First Data makes a lot of money. Square loses money. Also, First Data's revenues about the same on par with PayPal's. Yet instead of having the same valuation, PayPal trades at roughly 4.6 times higher than First Data. That's wrong. That's just wrong. My point, First Data is simply trading too cheaply right now in relation to those companies. And with management finally ready to push the company forward and take down their debt, is the one they generate a huge amount of cash. I think this one goes higher. First Data is right. This was a break that we got this equity offering. I got to tell you, anytime you bought the Dollar General equity offerings, you made money. I'm thinking First Data could be the same. Now, back in mid-August, we... We finally call up NVIDIA, yeah, NVIDIA, and VTA, a name that I believe is one of the biggest growth stories in this market, maybe of our time. We took it out of the bullpen, put it into the portfolio. But before I talk about the company's superior chips and processors that are essential in seemingly every major aspect of current and, more importantly, future technology, let's briefly recap the action alerts history with the stock. While I've always liked the stock of NVIDIA, I prioritize other growth names for the trust that traded at much more reasonable valuations to current earnings because that is one of the most important financial considerations for a trust when we look at adding uh, in or initiating positions. So instead, we added Broadcom, which is uh, the symbol of Vago, AVGO, which is at 245, that's a buy, uh, and Activision Blizzard to the trust, and that's ATVI. Uh, both are great companies, and, and they, I, I have higher expectations for them, and have been extremely pleased with them right now. I mean, is it too late to buy Activision at 65? No. Too late to buy uh, Broadcom right here at 245? No, I would do that right here. However, as we watched NVIDIA move up, I knew I had to figure out a way to get this darn thing into the trust, as their best-in-class chips and the company's explosive growth figures, what, it just uh, justifies what is indeed a lofty valuation. So we finally added NVIDIA into our bullpen. Following our July call, the stock began to climb. When August call came around, the stock was at 170. I thought maybe we should have dipped in a position back in the mid-160s, but I knew we had to stay disciplined as I teach you. We had to wait. Finally, after waiting and waiting, sticking to our convictions and our discipline, we got the exact pullback we were looking for, which is why we initiated a pre-market alert to quickly catch the discount, getting in it just before the almost 8% surge the stock just saw on that day alone. Long story short, we waited and waited, and the patience has paid off. We ended up getting the stock at 160 bucks, despite the pre-market bid-ass price being a few dollars below this, but still a nice discount from previous levels. Well, here it is at 171, up a buck 46. If that thing goes through 174, it's, head, it's uh, all-time high. I think that goes, goes right to 180. So what is this NVIDIA? And I'm not talking about my dog that I named after the amazing company. Of course, my wife continues to call the dog incorrectly, Everest. The company produces the best GPU chips in the world, uh, graphic uh, processing, okay, in the world. Uh, and, and that's important. And that combined with its Tegra SOC, okay, NVIDIA's product sets the standard in graphics, in artificial intelligence, and in deep learning. We'll talk about the three trends that we have to be most, most involved in. The cutting edge processors are the industry's leader because of its advanced software language and are used in gaming, autonomous driving, the cloud, very cheap, very cheap way to be able to replace a lot of stuff that's in data centers. And yes, cryptocurrency mining, just to name a few. Listing out some users of NVIDIA's technology might help us here. You got to start with the hottest game in the country, the one that is Best Buy's having a hard time sto uh, uh, stocking, it, the Nintendo Switch. It, it, it's entirely powered by uh, NVIDIA's custom-made Tegra processor, as well as other specifically designed units, which all support and enhance Switch's gameplay. In addition, Adobe's Creative Cloud contains NVIDIA's GPUs, which Adobe uses to create real-time websites. You might have seen me use that process or may have money. It's all NVIDIA. Lastly, I'd be remiss not to mention that when Tesla and Mobileye had that feud and discontinued their partnership, NVIDIA was able to step in in record time to provide autonomous driving chips to Tesla. Tesla, what can I say? It's what people regard as the benchmark. They use NVIDIA. 
These are just a few recent success stories that major companies have had using NVIDIA's chips. They're also behind the voice in Alexa, the voice in the new Google uh, product. Voice is so important. And, and with such big names as clients, it should come to no surprise that NVIDIA sales are growing at an astounding pace. How fast? All right, last quarter, NVIDIA's total revenues increased by 56% year over year driven by 52% year-over-year growth in gaming, represents NVIDIA's largest business. Remember, the number of gamers is so gigantic. Another reason why we bought Activision Blizzard. Next highest in total revenue is Data Center, which grew 175% year-over-year. They are taking share from everybody. Those are pretty strong numbers, if you ask me. But enough about the past. Those gains have already been captured. I think the stock still has a lot of room to run. So I'm focused on uh, growth in both deep learning and big data, which will drive revenue in uh, NVIDIA's data chips. Their chips are smaller, faster, and cheaper. In addition, I expect further expansion in the gaming industry from catalysts like eSports. You've read our Activision Blizzard initiation. And virtual reality. Again, you need that in NVIDIA for uh, gaming. Do you know that Take-Two actually delayed uh, Red Dead in order to be able to get the NVIDIA chips because it was much more lifelike? And also, while the stock has benefited from the increase in demand for cryptocurrencies, I want to point out that I do not see this as a pure cryptocurrency play, despite the fact that the stock was down this morning as people were saying, ooh, China ruled out Bitcoin. Benefits from crypto is estimated to account for only about 10% of the company's quarterly sales. 10%. Sure, it's a nice boost. But as I just mentioned, the growth in gaming and data center revenue is the real focus here. And remember, not everybody trades in China. Bitcoin, uh, crypto, cryptocurrency mining is a worldwide factor. Stop selling the stock on that. That's why the stock's at only 171 and not 180. So while I finally got this name into the trust, we're not too late in this growth story. And take a look where Intel was in 93, 94. It think like that, okay? I think the stock can go higher based off the growth and expansion in the areas I just mentioned. Please refer to the initiation alert to analysis posts, weekly roundup bulletins for more about details about the company. And of course, a lot of these are in response to your queries uh, that we get as part of the club. And I want to make this point again for NVIDIA. Go back and look at the way that Intel ran from the, all the, through the 90s. This is an Intel-like story. It's got more applications, though. Finally, before I get to your questions, let's go over some of the naughtier issues facing the portfolio. All right, first is the oils. Oils at 50. We said that this is when we reevaluate. These certainly have become our cross to bear. Oil, real crude oil, West Texas Intermediate, has done a couple dollars up since the last call. But uh, all our oil and gas-related stocks uh, lately have gone higher. Our goal would been to trim our stocks if oil went through 50. It just has. I don't know if it'll stay there, but look how tough this is. Apache, which we'll talk about in a second, it's down 50 cents. What a tough one. Anyway, so we've done nothing except our one pickup of Magellan, which we were using on a yield basis. Remember, MMP we regard as being a yield play. It's an, it, that's an income producer, not necessarily an oil company because it's not really, it doesn't have that much risk to oil. When it yields nearly 5.5, and it was, when it did that, it was, a, it was just too high to ignore, so we bought some. Importantly, outside of that one small buy, we haven't sold, we haven't bought. Sometimes you're in a quandary. We're in a quandary. We never stopped researching, and I can tell you this. First, there's so much oil trapped in the Permian, and oil prices are still so low, the Magellan midstream is in the driver's seat. I think barring a gigantic decline in oil, you know that MMP is bottom. Simerex, what can I say? Uh, down 26 cents today, but as I told you last go-around, it had the single best quarter of any oil company. See, we did all this homework. And it still didn't produce gains. That is going to happen at times. Um, but this company did produce the most oil for the least amount of money. It's leapfrogged over EOP, G, and Pioneer as the fair-haired boy in the patch. What am I going to do, though? We own a lot. Schlumberger is going up because oil refuses to crater. It's too good a company to turn your back on. I think it, too, has bottom. It's only up 34 cents. Remember, I think oil's going to have a lid here. Maybe it goes back down. It's not where I want to sell it. It's just not. All right, let's talk about Apache, which I've done more work on and have spoken to management. And I think I've done, again, sometimes your work doesn't get the job done. It's the most painful stock in the portfolio. I believe it has bottomed too, barring an unlikely plummet through 40 for oil. I am saying this. I'm saying I think it's bottom. If we did not own so much Apache, I would buy some here. Uh, I really would, which is why on this call, I'm taking it from a three, which means don't buy, to a two, Okay. It's gotten down too low. I have enough faith in their management to believe that there really is a huge find in their alpine high formation, and it is not all natural gas liquids. I think it's really good. Patchy at 42. 
If I own none, I'd buy some here. And then if it went below 40, I'd buy more. We own so much, we can't do a thing. All right, how about GE? All right, this is one of the toughest stocks I've ever had to deal with. And I don't like tough when it comes to stocks. The reason it's tough, because GE is no longer run by Jeff Immel. It's run by John Flannery, whom I've met. I think he's going to be doing a very good job. Uh, it, 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 previous management destroyed a lot of value here. My take is that it's too low to sell. But I can't count on it's buying it until John tells us more about what he intends to do with the company. I say that because John is no longer saying the dividend is inviolate. He's changed the language. He's simply saying it's a firm priority. If GE cuts the dividend, I do, not ha- uh, I do not know how the stock stays in the 20s. So here's what I am going to do. I'm going to hold on to it, but take it down to a 2, pending more visibility as to what Flannery intends to do on the dividend. Remember, I tell you what I'm doing here. The mutual funds that own it, it's owned by mutual they're never going to tell you a thing. I tell you I made a mistake it, because it's a club, and you know, if we don't, don't tell, don't tell you how I really feel, then I think, well, what's the point, all right? Um, it's bad break. There are going to be bad breaks in this business. Let's speak of bad breaks. How about Newell? What can I say? We sold a lot much higher. We had a decent win, but we kept some. That was a mistake. But you would have had to seen Hurricane Harvey coming to know it would go all that bad. All that resin you see in Rubbermaid, the products, it's made right there. The factories went offline. Plus, the sales channel has been having trouble itself. Something we've talked about before when we downgraded the stock to a three to urge you not to buy it. My take, if it goes below 42, it's at 43.60 right now, I'm going to pick. Because then it'll only be valued at 14 times earnings. That's too cheap, even though uh, the company post the Jordan acquisition has, uh, has had a more difficult time. Remember, they sell a lot into the sporting goods channel, which is bad. I now believe it's no longer as good as it was when uh, the company uh, before, had, before it bought Jordan. At least not yet. So, Jordan... Uh, Newell, GE, Apache, very tough situations. Now, finally, many of you have asked about Allergan. I totally get it. What a disappointment. Ever since the aborted Pfizer bid, we've owned this for a long time. And I have sat down with management every single quarter. The company made a move to shield some of its key patents worth about 10% of its revenues by tying it in with an Indian tribe to make them beyond the reach of U.S. law for patent trolls. Not for all, because there's still a court case involving. Hey, it's a clever move, but it does say that the attacks on restasis, that's the dry eye drug from generic companies, may have more substance than we thought. I'm surprised the stock went up because some people think it was an act of desperation. Uh, Either way, the company's stock trades well below its growth rate. We'd be buyers at anything through uh, that goes through if it goes below 220, it's at 225. Again, at 226 right now, it's painful, but it sells at such a low multiple, and it's it, it, it's just not correct. But I gotta wait. I gotta wait until people understand that the restasis, even if it went, if, if there was generic competition, the stock doesn't belong this low. I'm gonna just stay on it. That's all I can do is stay on it. Continually meeting with Brent Saunders, uh, getting to know the cool sculpt, the new product, really staying close to their migraine product, which I think is revolutionary, staying close to their product that they have for um, uh, men, for well, you know, central nervous system, but what but it really is, is for depression. It's a brand new product. It was on the cover of Time magazine. I'm not giving up on Allergan. I want to buy more if it breaks here. 